Israel, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. And he went on to say, the Ahafta, the Riyakha, Kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Ki Mitsion de de Torah. Ki Right now to you, Father, for comfort. They're, they're mourning the loss of, the earthly loss of, of a father and a grandfather. And we just pray, Father, that you would comfort them. We thank you so much that so much forgiveness has entered this family. You have reigned in this family. You have cleansed that which needed to be cleansing, Father. And that you bring shalom. Thank you for each one. Strengthen, heal, draw this family closer and closer together. We're so grateful for each one of them, Lord. Yes. And we see two generations here. Bless your name, Father. If anybody has a word of, of, of prayer and encouragement, please just start. <laughs> Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Then Jacob said to Joseph, How should I appear to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and bless me? And said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Mm -hmm. Adonai. Adonai. 
Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, our King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and set everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. It's a Jewish tradition to say this together at the end because we've, we've gone through one of the portions of the word that the Lord has given us and we always need to be strengthened and encouraged to go forth moment by moment by moment and that's what this reminds me of so say it with me it's Kazak 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 just be strong, strong be strong, strong and, may and may we be strengthened Jewish prayer and Jewish blessing is always about we and us it's not about me because we're all one and it's such a blessing to remind it even in something just so simple as that son because he came from the wife who he loved so much um, and you probably know that there's a lot of parallels between Joseph and Yeshua as a Messiah figure so for one thing when he was stripped of his coat as Yeshua was stripped of his garment basically um, go ahead I don't have the so he was stripped of his coat remember that so in Genesis 45 now, Joseph could not restrain himself in the presence of all who stood before him. So he called out, remove everyone from before me. And this is when his brothers come forth and they've gotten grain and they've come a second time. And the brothers do not know that Joseph, who is acting as if Pharaoh, and he's, he's looking Egyptian, so they don't recognize his brother, but he certainly recognizes them. And now he's moved inside and he asks for those that are around him, the men that are around him to leave the room so he can be alone with his brothers. And when his brothers realize it's Joseph and what they've done to him by stripping him of his coat, by throwing him in a pit, by bringing the coat back to the father with blood so that it looked as if Joseph was killed by an animal. And that's what Jacob went on to believe for years and years that his son was killed by an animal. And the sons and the brothers that they were to Joseph had to live with that amazing guilt that would have come almost immediately I would say after or shortly thereafter and years went on and they lived with that guilt and now they're looking at the one who they threw into the pit who they left for dead much as if we I have done to Yeshua you know nope all set as we think we turn away but we do not turn away because he is always right there and Joseph says this to his brothers, therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold, and you can't see it, it's in red, but it says that you sold Aleph Tav, and then it says me in English. And the Aleph Tav are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, if you're not familiar with them. And those two letters are sprinkled all over scripture as if drops of Messiah's blood. Not translated, usually, in this case, it actually is translated, and it's translated into me. So Joseph is saying that you have, don't, uh, don't be grieved that you sold Aleph Tav me here, as if Yeshua, who was also sold for a price, who paid that price, who willingly paid that price for ransom, to preserve life. So I always go back to Genesis because, and back to the coat. So Jacob creates a coat or gives a coat to, uh, to Joseph. And the word used for coat in Genesis, what we just read about Joseph, is ketonet. The first time a word appears in Hebrew, it's a beautiful blessing to see what it referred to. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. So they have sinned, and now they're, in, they're shamed because they recognize pretty much right away that they've sinned, just like the brothers when they threw Joseph into the pit. <coughs> pretty quickly thereafter, they would have recognized that they were in shame that they sinned. So the Lord says to Adam and, and Eve, did the Lord God make, I'm sorry, the Lord made coats of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us. That word for coats here, now they're in shame. They're naked, truly naked now because they've, they've sinned. The Lord makes a coat of skin for them, but the same one that's used for Joseph's coat that Jacob made for the son that he loved so much is the same one that's used here. The only other time that that word appears in scripture relates to the high priests. 
Their coat was also called as Ketanet. And kingship, David and his daughter. Those are the only three times that it appears in terms of priest, in terms of king, and then Joseph's coat, and then also right here. Because we know that we're clothed. It's like, it's like saying that we're clothed in Messiah. In our sin, in Adam and Eve, and in their sin, they're clothed, the Lord clothes them immediately as if they weren't already clothed because he died before the foundation of, of the world. And salvation was before the foundation of the world. And when it says, Behold, man has become like one of us, we think, well, that means knowing good and evil, and yes, there's something to that, but it's also, you've become Messiah as well with that. With knowing good and evil, but then the Lord covers and, 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 and heals and restores and saves. And in so doing, we become as unto, as unto Messiah. And in Isaiah, this always blesses me because this so relates to that whole aspect of the coat of being covered of salvation. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. In Hebrew, salvation is Yeshua, so in the scripture it literally says he's clothed me in Yeshua. So it's like the coat from Adam and Eve when the Lord covers them with a coat of, of skin. It's like the coat that Jacob gives to his son that he loves the most. It's the coat that's put around the priest, who, the high priest who is Yeshua, the high priest who dwells in you, and we're called to be priests. So we have that coat, and we're to go out as him and love, and have that mercy and love that he so far be provides beyond our understanding, way beyond our understanding. And in Romans, clothe yourselves with Messiah. And when it says clothe yourselves, I, I do believe that is said that way in Greek. However, I don't feel like I clothe myself in that. He clothes me in that because we don't we don't really we don't do anything to get that. It's a free gift for us. It's our salvation that He clothes us in. Thank you, Father. Love and mercy. I was grieved because can you stop the recording? Okay. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm going to talk about today um, a, a topic that for some might be a really basic topic. Funny thing is people often come to Messianic Jewish synagogues just to meet. You know? People are like, I got enough milk where I was. I'm coming here for some meat. <laughs> Everybody becomes carnivores <laughs> once they come into the synagogue. Give me some meat. Well, today I'm going to give you some milk because we can get a little thirsty too, you know. <laughs> and we are entering into a land of milk and honey. And last I checked with the children of Israel, they said, give me some meat. God overstuffed them with meat. So you can get overstuffed if you keep looking for the meat, the meat, the meat, the meat, the meat. I think there's incredible revelation in that. You know, I want some meat, I want some meat, I want some meat. The deeper things, the deeper things constantly, you can get overstuffed. So I'm going to give you some milk. I I've said it before that um, I have the easiest job in preaching because... Uh, when I became a rabbi, I said, Lord, how the heck am I going to think of things to say every single week? Um, the Lord told me it would be pretty easy, because I'm always talking to you, about you, and how you need to grow, and how you need to improve. So just kind of share what I'm talking to you about. So I'm going to do that. Um, I've been having a little bit of a, a wrestling match with the Lord recently over the last couple of weeks and the Lord as usual won <laughs> right. it wasn't a big right it wasn't like a steel cage match or something like that it was you know maybe a couple of it was more I was questioning him about certain things and it was uh, something that's pretty basic that's why I say milk and the topic that um, that I was asking him about that I was kind of wrestling with, is the topic of prayer and the efficacy of prayer. And let me explain, because my mind sometimes gets very logical. And I started to over-logic prayer. And here's sort of what I was thinking. I was like, Lord, 
we're praying for a lot of things. We pray for help. We pray for uh, finances or, 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 or our country. Or we pray for Israel. It even says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, if you already know what's going to happen, and you already have the answer, and the answer is already ordained, what is the value of my prayer in this thing? Because, like, like if I see this, and I look at that, and I'm like, okay, that needs prayer. And, because in my head, it should look like this. So if I look at this, and I'm like, Lord, something's wrong here. This is not of you, Lord. It needs to be this. Like, whether it becomes this, or stays this, or becomes this, the Lord knows the answer already. So what is the value of my prayers about it? Because I may or may not be within the Lord's will when I pray. I may not be praying for the answer that He has already ordained. And even if I am, the Lord's going to do what He wants anyway. But He does what He wants. It's His will be done. So what is the value? What's the purpose of my prayers? And I had a little bit of a Q&A time with God about it. That's probably more accurate than a wrestling match. Sort of a Q&A time about what's, why am I praying? What, and even Yeshua said, you know, when he was asked, how do we pray? He said, pray, God made your will be done. He made it really simple. Your will. That's pretty simple. So why do we pray for things? Why do we pray for people's health? Why do we pray for finances or, 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 or peace or, 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 or anything we're praying for, our friends, our family? Why are we praying for these things if the Lord already has the answer? Like he's going to do it anyway. Does our, is our prayers going to cause it to change? I don't know. These are the things that I was questioning him about. And I got an answer about it. So I'm going to share the answer. And I feel now really strongly about this and passionate about it and strongly about prayer. So, it might be a little bit of milk because there's a lot of prayer warriors in this place. So, here's the answer I got. God saved us. Called us out. Not just to save us. Not just so we can say, like, we're saved, we're saved, glory, hallelujah. Not even just to assure, like, where we go. Not just to assure that we're going to be part of the kingdom when Messiah comes. It's, it's not just about salvation. He called us out to partner with Him to change the world. There's a Jewish concept called tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. And God, we are in God's process of reconciling the whole world back to himself. But he did not just call us to be saved and go to heaven. If he called us to be saved and go to heaven, he would have saved us and killed us. <laughs> but he's got us here for a reason... And the reason we are here, the reason why he called out a people, the reason he called out Abraham, and then Isaac, and Jacob, and then more people, and then a people group, and then a nation, was to change the world. And partner with him to do so. Now we as believers, whether we know it or not, we straddle the line between flesh between the natural and spirit. And sometimes we have a good grasp of that and sometimes we don't have a good grasp of that because we're kind of living in a natural world. 
But we are like, we got one, one foot like here and we always have another foot in the Spirit. And when He calls us to affect change, God has called us to affect change. In the natural and in the Spirit. So, I mean, how do we affect change? Now, in the natural, we can logic out like what we do to affect change change in the natural. You know, when we when we when we minister to somebody, if somebody's sick and we minister to that person or somebody's not well and we go and we, we counsel, that's you know, affecting change. If we if we get involved in social issues or just the social justice issues, those are affecting change. Those are things that we could do in the in the natural to affect change. But what the Lord told me is that if you want to affect change in the spirit, the answer to that is prayer. Because prayer is not just words that go up. So we're about to enter into the book of Exodus next week because we finished Genesis and our Torah reading cycle. And in a few weeks, we'll start to learn about the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And, we, and the tabernacle is a foreshadow, it's a replica of us. Because the, in, in the middle of it is the Holy of Holies, the Word of God is in there, Yeshua is the Word of God, He lives in us. And one thing we see in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, is incense going up. God, in His wisdom, placed incense in the Mishkan, and the priest lights it in the morning, lights it in the evening, and what does the incense represent? Prayer. Prayer. The New Testament actually is explicit in saying that the, the, the incense is the prayers of the saints. And what happens is the prayers go up, the incense from prayers goes up into the heavenlies, and it becomes a part of what God is doing to repair the world. There are not prayers that are meaningless or are for naught. They go up, and I believe that even prayers that we prayed 20 years ago for somebody are still going up. It's part of that incense offering. Nothing is wasted. But once it's up in heaven, it's like, it's like, our in, it's like how we interject into heaven. And God, who is operating things, and He's making things happen, and His will is being done, there's a lot happening in the spiritual realm that we don't fully understand. But we can't be just blind to that. There is a, a war happening in spirit. There is battle happening in spirit. There's a lot going on. And the way that we affect change is through our prayers and having it go up as incense into heaven and God takes it and does what he wants with it and it's kind of a mystery but I tell you that your prayers that are up there affect what God is doing. They are there for it's part of the thing. It's part of the job. Can God do it without it? Yeah, he can do anything. But his, his will is for us to partner with him on earth and in heaven. And it's not just prayer, obviously, it's praise. You know, because when we do things like that, when we throw things up into heaven, it affects change in the heavenlies, in the spirit, which in turn affects things down here. I mean, we see that with the, with the, with the armies of Israel on how when they went forward, they didn't put like the best warriors in the front line. They didn't put like the guys with the, you know, the sharpshooters, you know, in the front line. Who did they put in the front line? Singers. That sounds like a really interesting battle plan. We're going forward, we're marching forward, you know, and who did they put in the, in the front? Singers. It doesn't make sense. But in spirit, what's happening is that the, the praise from these singers goes up and affects change more so than a line of sharpshooters in the natural. Because those singers, the prayers, the 
the songs go up into heaven, effect change, and which can in turn affect what's down here. This is why in the in the battles of Israel that we read in like the book of Chronicles, Chronicles, when when the singers and the the, pra- the praisers were in front, and they started the enemies, they 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 started to beat each other up, and they started to get confused and confounded, and the battle was won. This is doing something down here and it's affecting the spirit. And in turn, the spirit affects the natural. So it's not... And you know, we, we tend to think that like... Because prayer can sometimes feel by rote. Oh Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help me. In Jesus' name. Amen. It can sound by rote. But I don't find anywhere in the Bible that it says that if your prayer is emotional or not, it makes a difference. I know we feel that when we go, Lord, I pray for this person in Jesus' name, it sounds less effective than we go, Lord, heal that person, heal that person, heal that person. I know it seems less effective when we just kind of bleh it. When we bleh it. But I'm telling you, it doesn't say anything like that in the Bible that you got to like... You know, it's dependent upon like our, our emotional state or how, how we feel at the time. It's got nothing to do with how we feel. But I encourage you to lift your voice to the Lord. Because those words are not, they will not return void. They're part of the process. Yes, God is going to do what God does, but He needs your prayers. He wants your prayers. It's part of the battle plan. Amen. Not only that, God can change His directive Amen. based on prayers. Amen. There are various examples of that. The book of Amos, Amos, the prophet saw a vision of, 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 of locusts coming and he started to scream to the Lord, Lord, may it not be. No, Israel can't withstand this. Right. So the Lord changed his mind and said, no, it will not be. And then the prophet saw another vision of fire consuming Israel. And he said, Lord, make it stop. Israel cannot handle this. And it says the Lord changed his mind. <coughs> And it was not. We know in the book of Yonah, the book of Jonah, that there was an assignment against Nineveh. But their repentance and their humbling of their hearts turned the assignment away. And of course, the, 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 the forefather of this whole concept was Moshe Rabbeinu himself, Moses, our teacher who when God was so upset with the children of Israel, he said, you know what, I'm going to get rid of them, I'm starting with you. He didn't say, well, may your will be done. (laughs) Far from me to stop you, Lord. He went on his face, he said, no. No. And if the Lord changed his mind, it specifically, Specifically says he changed his mind. What does this mean? That when we entreat the Lord, spiritual assignments against us, against people, against anything can be changed. Hallelujah! Through our prayers. Don't ever forget that. You can see this. And if you want it to be this, and maybe it is the Lord's will for this to happen, but your prayers can take this and throw it away because, because the Lord used your prayers to make His will be done. So you are warriors in this thing. You are agents of change in the world and in spirit. I, I, I wish I could visualize it. I wish I could visualize the prayer going up to heaven, but it doesn't just stay there. It's activated, something happens with it, and it's used as a weapon. It is. In spirit. For the Lord to do what he wants to do. Now we know that not every prayer we pray gets answered the way we think. 
Mature believers know that. You don't even have to be that mature to know that. That things happen and it's not the way we prayed. Even still, lift up your prayers to the Lord. Unceasingly, they are part of the process. God wants the prayers to go up. That's why he put the incense in the Mishkan. That get lit up every morning, every evening, every morning, every evening, every morning, every evening. He wants it to go up because that is a spiritual weapon. And don't forget it. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? We know there's going to be war until Messiah comes and then there's going to be peace. We know the story already. Why do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem when we know there's going to be war? Because your prayers are weapons. They're part of this whole process, the whole journey ordained by the Lord. There is a value in those prayers. It's part of what he will use in his arsenal to bring about his will. So the whole concept that I had my Q&A wrestling time with is illogical, does it make sense? Lift up your prayers to God. It is spiritual weaponry. It says you who call upon the Lord, you who remind the Lord, it says for Zion's sake I will not be silent. For Zion's sake I will not withhold my peace. And it, it charges us, it says, you who remind the Lord, remind the Lord for the sake of Zion. Isaiah said, the Lord wants reminders. And that's something else that our prayers do. They remind the Lord. How do you remind the Lord? He knows everything. He knows, he knows then and now, beginning, end, backwards, forwards. He knows the whole thing. What type of reminder does he need? Well, he wants us to remind him. Look at the children of Israel. They were enslaved and they cried to the Lord. And it says in next week's Torah portion that the, the Lord heard their cries and he was reminded of his covenant with Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And he came to the rescue. Look at Hannah, the woman who was barren, who just prayed and prayed and prayed, and, it says, and then the Lord remembered the prayers of Hannah, Hannah. And she became pregnant. And the book of James says the prayers of the righteous are what? Come on, you Bible scholars. The prayers of the righteous are what? Avail much. Avail much. That means they do, they act, they operate. These are like entities. They do their thing. It says in one translation, they avail much. In another, they are effective. They're not ineffective. So please stand up. Father, we lift up our prayers to you. We lift up our voices to you, Lord God. We know, Lord God, that you, you, you take our prayers, you use them, they're part of the process for your will to be done on earth, Lord God. It's part of the process that you use to reconcile the world to yourself, but not just the world, our loved ones to you, not just our loved ones, ourselves to you, the people that you've put on our hearts. Lord God, you want us to lift it up to you. Lord God, because the journey that you have for this one that we're praying for, this journey is laid with the prayers of your people who have this one in their heart for a reason. So Lord, help us to not withhold Help us to not withhold the things you put on your heart and say, that's stupid, I can't pray for that, or it's worthless to pray. It says Yeshua said, knock, and knock, and knock, and knock, and knock, and keep knocking. And our good, good Father will not give 
a stone instead of bread. Or a... So, Lord, help us to, to pray to you, Lord God. Help us to lift up our voices to you and not be dismayed. Help us, Lord God, remind us to lift up our voices to you, Lord God, and send out that call into the heavenly so you can take it and say, aha, and use that in any way you wish. Thank you, Adonai. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Adonai. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being the God that heals, hears, and answers prayers. Thank you, Adonai, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Adonai, that every prayer that we since we started to pray has not been fruitless. Thank you, Adonai, that every prayer that we prayed is being heard and entered in. It entered into the to, to the to the to the incense. It was part of the incense offering that came up to you. It was not useless. It didn't go onto a a, a a hard heaven. We hear that expression sometimes like the heaven is a place. Are you kidding me? Our prayers penetrate that. That's the purpose. Thank you, Father. We love you. 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 You are awesome, Adonai. You are awesome, Adonai. You are awesome. Thank you, Adonai, for calling us to be agents of change. Thank you, Adonai, for calling us to, to, to partner with you as you restore the world to yourself. Hallelujah. Yeshua's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom!